So today I'm hosting uh, Birgul Demirtas, a professor of international relations at the Turkish German University in Istanbul. Uh, Birgul Demirtas's studies concentrate on Balkan politics, amongst others. So we will discuss uh, Turkish foreign policy towards the Balkans, the perception of the Balkan region in the Turkish public opinion, and whether there are any changes in Turkish foreign policy following the May presidential and parliamentary elections. Birgul Demirtas is Professor of International Relations at the Department of Political Science and International Relations of Turkish German University in Istanbul. Her studies concentrate on Turkish foreign policy, Balkan politics, German foreign policy, Turkish political parties and migration, city diplomacy and gender. Between 2019 and 2021, Birgul was the managing editor of the academic peer review Journal of International Relations. She has articles published in Southeast European and Black Sea Studies, Journal of Balkan and Near Eastern Studies, the Turkish Yearbook of International Relations, and many other journals. So, um, Birgul, in your PhD and later on in your publications, you focused on the role of Germany and Turkey in the Yugoslav wars of the 1990s and their aftermath. Would you say that your own academic and professional preferences in this regard reflect the interest that the Turkish citizens in general have towards the Yugoslav wars and um, how everything that happened during the 1990s shaped the image of our region here in the Turkish society? Um, thank you very much for your invitation and thank you uh, for the question. In fact, the main security issue in global politics in the 1990s was uh, the wars in former Yugoslavia. And um, in my PhD thesis, I argued that Germany and Turkey were um, among the most affected countries by the end of the Cold War. Germany got united and um, Turkey had some difficulties with its identity that uh, was established during the Cold War. You know, Turkey had a very clear identity during the bipolar system. It was part of the Western Bloc and the Soviet Union was the main enemy. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, Turkey needed to find a new orientation for itself. Turkey needed to change its foreign policy. And at that very time, the wars in former, former Yugoslavia started. And I tried to understand how um, Turkey um, pursued its foreign policy towards um, the conflict in former Yugoslavia. And um, I also um, tried to understand it through the prism of um, you know, Turkey's new global position. Um, I argued that, I claimed that when Turkey uh, was uh, trying to determine its foreign policy towards the conflict, um, in the Balkans, at the same time, it was trying to find a new identity and a new location for itself in the global politics. I mean, mainstream public opinion was that, you know, um, Muslim peoples in the Balkans were suffering a lot. You know, they were the main victims um, during the conflicts and there was much affection, much empathy towards Muslim groups um, in the uh, Balkans. And when we think about Turkey and the Balkans, um, we need to remember that, you know, Turkey is part of the region. Therefore, Turkish foreign policy towards the Balkans is something different from like Turkish foreign policy towards Africa or Turkey's relations with Latin America. You know, Turkey is part of the Balkans. Therefore, when something happens in the Balkans, I mean, it has a clear um, um, impact on the Turkish domestic politics, on Turkish foreign policy um, as well. And, um, and what makes Turkey different from so many different actors in the Balkans, um, I mean, is that um, historical um, and humanitarian ties with the Balkans. You know, Turkey is part of the region. It is one of the important countries in the Balkan region. When something happens, 
in Belgrade, in Sofia, in um, Kurdali, um, in Sarajevo, I don't in Podgorica. In Podgorica, it has um, a clear impact on Turkey because we have so many um, Balkan immigrants within the country. I mean, these humanitarian ties are so important. I would argue. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to ask you maybe uh, something precisely in this regard because, according to some sources, almost twenty percent of the Turkish population is of Balkan origin. And uh, uh, to what extent does this influence the Turkish decision-making policy towards the region, uh, particularly, you know, when it comes to foreign policy? I mean, uh, to what extent this foreign policy, and as you say, and is partially not even foreign policy, has an internal political dynamic in Turkey? Um, as you stated, um, according to many academic sources, at least 20% of Turkish population has some sort of Balkan origin. You know, um, some people are migrated from the Balkans um, to the Ottoman Empire during um, the later stages of the Ottoman Empire, during the Balkan Wars, and later on, um, some migrated after the Turkish Republic was established. Uh, some migrated in the later years. Um, in the 1980s and um, in the 1990s. Um, and many of those Balkan immigrants kept their ties uh, with their um, you know, origins in the Balkans. I mean, they have this Balkan identity. Um, for example, I know um, some people in Turkey, um, of, uh, they are of Bosniak origin, and they have never been to Bosnia Herzegovina, or they have never been to abroad. They have never been to the Balkans, but still within the family, they keep the language. You know, when they talk to each other within the family, they speak um, in um, in the Bosniak language or Serbian, Croatian, Bosniak language. I mean, that is important. You know, Balkan identity is kept in Turkey among the um, Balkan immigrants. And the second dimension is um, the Balkan immigrants in Turkey um, are quite organized. I mean, they have um, tens of different associations and foundations, Balkan associations, Romali associations, association of people coming from prison. You know, um, some, uh, some associations are more general, like the associations of the Balkans or Romelia associations, but some of them are more specific, you know, like this one, the association of people coming from Prizra. They have, you know, another association in Istanbul. Um, we have also some other associations as well, like people of Caucasus in origin, they also have their associations, but the Balkan people are the most organized. They have these non-governmental organizations. And through these non-governmental organizations, they try to have an impact on Turkish um, internal politics and Turkish foreign policy. That means um, when you know something happens in the Balkans, like the assimilation policy towards the Turkish minority in Bulgaria in the 1980s, or the problems of Turkish minority in Greece, you know when they have problems and they experience problems, or the wars in uh, former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. These NGOs become quite active and they push the Turkish decision makers to implement an active foreign policy, you know, to do something to stop the assimilation, to do something to stop the conflict. And these uh, Balkan immigrants are, um, I mean, they are, of course, distributed all around, all around Turkey. But um, they also they are also concentrated in some of the Turkish provinces, like Bursa, for example, in Marmara region, or Edirne, a city just um, in the border with Greece and Bulgaria, or Izmir, for example, in the Aegean region. I also uh, work on city diplomacy in Turkey, and when I work on uh, you know, city diplomacy of um, Turkish provinces, local diplomacy in Turkey, then I noticed that 
you know, those provinces with um, a concentration of Balkan immigrants, um, they uh, focus especially on the Balkan cities. You know, they try to establish sister city agreements. You know, they try to uh, pursue some um, international projects with those cities in the Balkans. Therefore, you know, um, Balkan immigrants have an impact on the city diplomacy of Turkey. Uh, you mentioned a lot of influence on uh, in the soft diplomacy, to, so to speak, field. Uh, uh, can we say that there's um, groupings, organization of uh, Balkan, so to speak, diaspora of Turkish citizens uh, have Balkan origin? Turkish citizens, to be precise, um, have also an impact on major, you know, foreign policy lines of Turkey in the region. And uh, if yes, uh, can you cite maybe some examples when their involvement was important in this regard? For example, um, during the um, um, wars in former Yugoslavia, you know, those um, immigrants and their associations had a clear impact on Turkish foreign policy. When I was writing my PhD thesis, um, I had interviews um, with a former president, I had interviews with a former minister of foreign affairs, and they told me that, you know, uh, they were affected uh, by um, the influence of the Balkan immigrants. For example, a former minister told me that, you know, uh, when um, an Albanian, you know, a Kosovo Albanian um, high level leader visited Turkey, they had the hesitancy, you know, to um, accept him officially uh, because of the conjecture. But because of the influence of the, you know, Albanian origin Turkish people, you know, they had to accept him. When something happens in the Balkans, when the Turkish minorities or you know, Muslim peoples were negatively affected. It is impossible for the Turkish decision makers to remain silent, you know, because of, you know, domestic reasons as well. They need to, they need to respond to it in an active way. And we also need to remember that some of these Balkan immigrants become um, ministers. I mean, such a dynamic um, is something specific to Turkey, I would say. Of course, you know, um, the European Union is a very important actor in the Balkans. Of course, Russia is important. China has an increasing influence, especially in terms of the uh, economic dynamics. But, you know, these humanitarian ties are specific to Turkey, I would argue. Therefore, you know, Turkey has a kind of special ties with the Balkans. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned the EU, and this leads me to um, my next question. How does Turkey uh, look at the EU and NATO membership of the Western Balkan countries? Um, in, it's looking at it superficially, it seems that Turkey is in favor of both. And why is that, in your view? As you um, stated, Turkey is supporting the Europeanization of um, the Balkan countries. Turkey is supporting both the NATO membership and the EU membership of um, the Balkan countries. Um, and that is not also something related to Turkey's um, EU process. You know, Turkey's um, membership process is kind of stalled at the moment. The negotiations are not continuing, you know, on paper, they are continuing, but in practice, in fact, um, Turkey-EU relations are not um, proceeding well. There are some um, difficult problems. But even those times when Turkey has difficulties um, in its own Europeanization process, you know, Turkey continues to support um, the European Union membership and NATO membership of the Balkan countries. It is because of the fact that, you know, peace, and stability in the Balkans um, is also being welcomed by Turkey. You now, Turkish leadership uh, is aware of the fact that you know if um, the Balkan, if all the Balkan countries become EU members, 
And um, if those countries who want to be NATO members, if they can get the NATO membership, that would contribute to the stability and peace in the region. Then uh, we would uh, kind of contribute to the establishment of a positive peace in the region. And we can just get away from the, we can have the transition from the negative peace and to the positive peace. Then the problems are between Kosovo and Serbia, the problems within Bosnia and Herzegovina would be kind of more easily solved. Turkey is aware of the potential of the European Union, especially. Therefore, even if Turkey has difficult times with the European Union, it is supporting the Europeanization process. With regard to the NATO membership, of course, um, Turkey has much more influence. Turkey is not an EU member. Therefore, you know, of course, Turkey can support um, the EU membership of the Western Balkan countries. But how much influence can Turkey have on Brussels? if Turkey is not within the club, within the EU club. But with regard to the EU, I'm sorry, with, with regard to the NATO membership, of course, Turkey is an important actor. Now, um, nowadays, with regard to the Sweden's application to NATO, I mean, we see how important a role Turkey is playing. Um, Turkey is a NATO member since 1952. And it means, you know, whenever the Balkan countries wanted to become NATO members, think about uh, the membership process of Bulgaria, Romania, um, Albania, North Macedonia, Turkey has supported all of them from the very beginning till the very end of it. It is because of the, you know, a Turkish um, argument that, you know, NATO membership and EU membership would contribute to the regional peace and stability. Maybe uh, to go more into granular activities of Turkey in the region, uh, if we can see um, the work of some Turkish agencies, such as TICA, in rebuilding and or reconstructing old architectural historical sites from Ottoman era in the Balkans, um, uh, would you consider these actions as part of this uh, soft power approach? Some would even say, going back to the um, one of the former ministers of foreign affairs, uh, the neo-Ottoman approach to the fir Turkish foreign policy in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Turkish foreign policy in general and um, Turkish foreign policy towards the Balkans in particular um, has become more multidimensional since the 1990s. I mean, the process has started before the Justice and Development Party came into power. I mean, we can take the end of the Cold War as the important turning point in Turkish foreign policy. But of course, in the recent years, since the 2000s, um, you know, the level of multidimensionalism has increased. And now Turkey does not have just kind of, you know, political relationship. But Turkish foreign policy um, is much more multidimensional. You have given the example of TICA, um, Turkish International Cooperation Agency. We can give the example of Yunus Emre Cultural Institutes. We, we can give the example of Dianet um, um, uh, facilities in the Balkans, Mara Foundation, you know, Turkish scholarship project, you know, giving scholarships to successful Balkan students, you know, all of them um, are part of this multidimensional Turkish foreign policy. Um, whether um, it is a symbol of um, a kind of neo-Ottoman foreign policy or not, um, I have a, a different argument. I think, you know, you know, what do we mean by um, neo-Ottomanism? Um, you know, I think in the Serbian context, sometimes it is so much exaggerated, you know. There are some um, Serbian colleagues, there are some Serbian experts who say that, you know, Turkey is trying to resurrect the Ottoman Empire. Turkey has, see, has still these ideals of, you know, recreating, you know, the Ottoman hegemony in the region. I think that is not the case. Um, of course, you know, the, the Ottoman history has an impact um, on Turkish foreign policy. Like, you know, the British Empire, the history of the British Empire has an impact on the current 
a British foreign policy. Therefore, of course, we cannot think about Turkish foreign policy, um, you know, without remembering the historical context. You know, I have just given um, the various examples of the humanitarian ties. You know, there is the Ottoman legacy, and the humanitarian ties are part of this Ottoman legacy. I would argue that uh, when we try to understand Turkish foreign policy towards the region, we need to um, um, interpret Turkey as a middle power in the current global context. I mean, Turkey is a middle power country. And as a middle power uh, country, uh, with regard to its economic size, with regard to its geographical size, with regard to its demographic size, and also with regard to its uh, military power, um, Turkey wants to be influential in the neighboring regions. Turkey wants to have good ties and Turkey wants to contribute to the stability and peace in the neighboring regions. And you know, Turkey's um, activities and Turkey's multidimensional foreign policy in the Balkans is mainly related to the middle power position of Turkey. Now, um, the past, the historical background, of course, plays a role. We cannot exclude it. But, you know, I would argue that the current um, government or the previous governments um, do not have any ideal of trying to create a kind of Ottoman hegemony in the Balkans. You know, Turkish foreign policy is a very pragmatic one. You know, Turkey's current leadership, I think they also think that, I mean, it is not possible to recreate the Ottoman times. Um, but also we need to differentiate between the rhetoric and practice of Turkish foreign policy. You know, when you just listen to the discourse of um, Turkish politicians, sometimes you might get the feeling that, you know, it is kind of, it, it includes some neo-Ottomanist elements. Um, it was very clear, for example, at, at the discourse of um, Ahmet Davutoglu when he was the foreign minister, then when he was the prime minister. You know, some of his speeches were full of some kind of, you know, Ottoman connotations and his uh, speech in Sarajevo in 2009, uh, I mean, uh, was not forgotten in the Balkans. I know he mentioned you know, reintegrating uh, the Balkan countries, but in fact, um, you know, some of this rhetoric um, has something to do with Turkish domestic politics. The discourse of Turkish politicians um, with regard to foreign policy issues um, has two dimensions. One dimension is related to the domestic politics, and one dimension is related to, you know international politics, um, especially during the election times, during the election campaigns, sometimes the Ottoman Empire is referred a lot and there are so many connotations with regard to the, you know, the good old times in the Ottoman Empire kind of thing. But sometimes it is just related to domestic politics. You know, Turkish politicians are um, addressing themselves to the Turkish electorate. But we, look, we need to look at the practice. For example, Tika, you know, so many Balkan um, experts and Balkan politicians claim that, you know, Tika is just uh, renovating the old Ottoman mosques. You know, when they um, talk on or when they write on Tika, they just focus on Tika and its restoration of the um, Ottoman mosques. But in fact, when we look at the practice, when we look at the actual data, what Tika is doing in the Balkans is much more complicated. Yes, Tika is renovating some of the Ottoman mosques. I mean, it should do. But in fact, it has been also giving so much aid to um, the hospitals in the Balkans, to the schools, you know, to the farmers. You know, it is much more multidimensional. But when when we say that you know Tika is just interested in the um, Ottoman mosques, it is just renovating them. I think it's a reflection of some, um, how to say, um, prototypes, you know, some prejudices. Because, you know, 
um, some of the Balkan um, intellectuals and politicians, you know, when they think about Turkish foreign policy, you know, they try they try to frame it in this so-called neo-Ottomanist perspective. But we need to look at the actual data. Yes, it, it is really uh, important that you um, explain this uh, for our public because uh, I must admit uh, there is a lot of prejudice when analyzing uh, the Turkish foreign policy in the Balkans, and this is a big part of it. But uh, what you have just said, um, maybe I um, want to uh, go to the next question. I'm interested um, if there are some red lines for Turkey when it comes to its foreign policy in the Balkans, something that is definitely not acceptable for Ankara. You know, Turkey has its red lines when it comes to the issue of Cyprus, Azerbaijan, so on, not to quote other examples. But is there anything similar in the Western Balkans region? I think the red line um, is um, the situation of Turkish minority in the Balkans, um, as well as um, the status of the Muslim peoples, you know, Kin people um, in the region. In some countries in the region, um, there are um, Turkish minority living, like in Greece, in Bulgaria, in North Macedonia, and in Kosovo. And, um, you know, the legal status of these people is quite important. And the second important group is the other Muslim peoples in the region, like the Bosniaks um, in Bosnia Herzegovina, and Albanians and other uh, Muslim groups as well. They are also seen as kind of kin groups in the region, because you know these Muslim peoples, uh, like the Albanians and Bosniaks, they have become Muslims during the Ottoman Empire, um, and that's why you know um, the, um, the the Islam practiced in the Balkan countries by these uh, Muslim people and the Islam practice in Turkey are so similar. There are, you know, there is this um, re- there is this religious and cultural similarity. Therefore, uh, these people, Bosniaks and Albanians, they are seen as kin group, and um, the status and legal rights of the Turkish minority and of these Muslim peoples. I think this is the red line. If their legal status, um, you know, is kind of changed, it changed, or um, if they have uh, real problems if they face discrimination, if they face violence, if there is conflict, um, then that is the red line for Turkey. Uh, but of course, um, Turkey, when, when something happens to those people, when these people suffer, when they have a security problem, um, then, you know, Turkey, Turkish leadership thinks that it needs to do something. It needs to be an active to end um, the conflict or to end the security problem. That's very interesting what you're pointing out to in, in, in our researchers, Srdjan Kertsigunya and Vukuk Sanovic, uh, in their paper on Turkish foreign policy towards the Western Balkans, talk a lot about this dichotomy and then between the, if we can call it psychological emotional and rational whereby on the emotional side it's very much this relationship towards as you call them kin groups in the balkans and states that matters whereas maybe from the rational point of view sometimes uh the support is given to the you know biggest western balkans country uh serbia and because of the economic relations and everything which of the two would prevail and a hypothetical situation where it has to choose for Turkey. Um, affinity towards kinship groups, as you mentioned, this is a red line, as you say, or uh, the this uh, desire to have good relations with, with the economic malwork of the Western Balkans. Mm-hmm. Um- but saying that, um, of course, Turkish foreign policy is not just based on 
religion or is not just based on these kinship groups. Um, I mean, it is much more than that. And I just would like to emphasize that, you know, Turkey is a very pragmatic actor in the Balkans. Of course, you know, Turkey's special ties with its Turkish minority um, and also Muslim peoples. But in fact, um, Turkish leadership also, you know, Turkey's current um, government also argues that, you know, um, we have um, cultural similarities with all the countries, with all the peoples in the region. And um, the increasing ties between Turkey and Serbia in the recent years uh, should be noted as well. And they also um, have some similarities in their foreign policy approaches. Think about, for example, how Serbia and Turkey are acting towards the um, Russian war in Ukraine. Both of them um, criticize uh, the Russian invasion. Both of them um, give support to Ukraine and they say that the Ukrainian territorial integrity should be protected. But they do not uh, take part um, in the European Union sanctions. There are good ties between the uh, Turkish leadership and Serbian leadership. Therefore, you know, when we think about Turkish foreign policy towards the region, um, it is not just related to um, the factor of the religion. You know, Turkey is not just trying to have good relations with the Muslim peoples. That's all. That is not the case. You know, from the very beginning, Turkey has been trying to have good relations with Macedonia since 1991, and. Turkey-Serbia relationship is another example that Turkish foreign policy in the region is not based on neo-Ottomanism, but it is based on pragmatism and it is based on the global conjecture and of course it is based on um, the um, characteristics of the current domestic agency in Turkey. Well, thank you very much for making this nuance. Uh, maybe... Um... As a final question, uh, I would like to ask you, so we had the May presidential and parliamentary elections in Turkey. Should we expect um, any changes when it comes to its foreign policy towards the Balkans in general or towards, for that matter, some specific country in the region? Um, I do not expect any kind of radical change in Turkish foreign policy towards the region because, you know, the same political party, the Justice and Development Party has won the elections and they have um, the majority in the Turkish parliament uh, together with um, its allies. Since the president is the same and the government is the same, I think um, the same parameters um, of Turkish foreign policy would continue in the Balkans. I do not expect to see any kind of uh, changes. Um, but um, I can just add that, you know, Balkans um, is in still important uh, on the agenda of Turkish foreign policy. You know, T Turkey as um, a middle power actor now um, um, has some difficulties in the Middle East. We know um, the situation in Syria, we know the situation in Iraq. Therefore, you know, Turkey's capability to be an effective actor in the Middle East is quite limited. And with regard to the Caucasus, then there is the uh, influence of the Russian Federation. Therefore, you know, Tur Turkey cannot be so much effective in the Caucasus region as well. But with regard to the Balkans, I think you know, Turkey's potential um, to be an effective um, regional country um, is much bigger compared to other regions. Therefore, I would say that, you know, Turkey would try, the, the current government would try to be an effective actor um, in the Balkans region. But there are so many challenges in the region. Let us see whether Turkey would do something with regard to the problems between Serbia and Kosovo. Um, that is um, an important question. And let us see whether Turkey would try to kind of refresh this trilateral mechanism among Turkey, Serbia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. You know, uh, Turkey had an initiative um, that was started in 2009, but you know, in the recent years, it is not so widely. And whether there would be kind of new initiatives or the, or the foreign initiatives would be kind of refreshed 
um, these are important question marks for us. We need to follow Turkish foreign policy towards the Balkans very closely, I think. So thank you very much, uh, Birgul. This has been very interesting and informative uh, for myself, and I'm certain for our listeners. Uh, thank you very much for joining us in our Lighthouse podcast. Thank you.